Right, hi. Um, anybody here uses Jenkins? I mean, I'm assuming everybody is using Python. Okay, so a lot of guys, so you might know some of the stuff I'm going to talk about. Um, okay, let's start. Who am I? My name is Barak. I work at Red Hat, as you can tell by the shirt color. Um, I get to work on Overit. Overit is a nice project. We build virtualization systems. Um, that's me. All right. So what I'm going to talk about? Um, I'm going to talk about you know a little bit about what is Jenkins. Most of you guys already know it. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, how to run, you know, why run Python code in Jenkins, and you know how to do it, how to do I/O for that Python code, you know, how to get data in and out of it, and also how to use some tricks to get some persistent, persistent state. All right, um, so what is Jenkins? You know, most of you have heard of it as the CI, CD automation tool. Of course, that is all buzzwords. Um, let's talk about what it actually does. Uh, so Jenkins is, a, is just a server. It gets events. It can get events from, uh, you know, uh, uh, code revision systems like GitHub, like Gerrit. Uh, it can get, um, you know, it can get other kinds of events. It can, you know, do get time events. It can get events from, you know, enterprise message buses or places like that. And once it gets events, it starts running jobs. Now it can run jobs on normal servers. It can run them on cloud infrastructure, you know, on Amazon on you know OpenStack, it can reuse you know container management platforms like Kubernetes to run jobs on them, and once those jobs run, it can take the output and you know deliver it back either to you know all kinds of places like code revision systems, like you know it can trigger webhooks, it can send emails, it has a web UI where you can see output. So this is basically what Jenkins is, what it does. So why actually try to use Python on Jenkins? Well, you know, when you typically, you know, write job logic in Jenkins, you either use a GUI or you can use Java to write Jenkins plugins or you can use Groovy. You know, those are okay languages, but, you know, we are in Python. Okay, thanks. You know, we're in Python. We like writing stuff in, uh, in Python. And once we do write it in Python, we can have all kinds of interesting things, like have the same code, you know, testing stuff in Jenkins and usable elsewhere. You know, have the developers be able to run the same code locally or stuff like that. Um, you can also use other Python tools. You know, you can use PyTest. You know, using PyTest to test the testing logic can be very, very useful. Um, all right, so before I continue, let's talk a little bit about Jenkins. Maybe most of you guys already know this. Uh, Jenkins has two kinds of jobs, actually. Uh, one is called freestyle. It's kind of the older kind of a Jenkins job. You use pretty much the Jenkins GUI to link together a bunch of plugins that do stuff. Um, it's actually it's quite rigid about how it works. You just you know it dictates that everything runs on one v on one slave machine and you know we first clone the code then you run build steps then you run post build steps but this is a freestyle job um, and then you have pipeline jobs which are a little bit more flexible and you actually write the entire you can write the entire job logic in groovy and you can decide when are you going to allocate nodes when how many nodes to allocate when to clone code and what to do with it and stuff like that all right so, um, how do you actually get Python running on Jenkins? So, you know, the easiest way, you know, Jenkins can trigger command line tools. So what you can do is, you know, write your Python code and then build a command line UI for it. You know, use something like uh, argparse to write, you know, an argument parser, and then just trigger it as you can see, you know, I don't know if you can see. Here. 
over here, over there, so you can just see, uh, you know, I'm triggering my command line tool. Now that take takes a little work, you know, if you're writing a command line tool anyway, so go ahead and use it, but just write a whole command line UI for your script just to run it from Jenkins, it's not really that much fun. Um, so everything in Jenkins happens in plugins. So you actually have multiple plugins you can use to run Python from Jenkins. You have the Python plugin, which essentially gives you a big text box. You text box you can type Python into, and it will run that Python. Um, you have the Shining Panda plugin, which is a little bit more complicated. Uh, it can run virtual environments. It can invoke tux. Know, do stuff like that. Then you have the Jiton plugin, which is very, very similar to the Python plugin, only it runs the Jiton interpreter instead of the Python interpreter. That's kind of useful in the Jenkins world because Jenkins is Java, and Java stuff works nicely with Jenkins. Um, but you can also run Python without any plugins. Jenkins can do it for free because of the way the Jenkins uh, normal command line functionality works. You know, it can let it lets you specify the shell that you're going to use. You know, in the normal, you know, Unix style uh, shebang line in the beginning of the script. So uh, you can just say, tell it to okay. You can just tell it. You know, use Python. You know, you can just add. You know, shebang var bin env Python. And uh, you know, just write your Python code. It will because Python behaves pretty similar to, to a shell. It just works. Um, so here you can see me do it in, it in two. You know, in both styles of jobs. Here on the right you have the uh, um, freestyle job. Just type in the shebang and your Python code. And on the left, you know, you have the groovy style job. So it's a little bit more work. I still need to allocate a node for the code to run on. Then I use the stage a function to just give me a nice GUI that says now I'm going to run the Python code and or it's going to actually type say hello in this case and then I just use a shell function to and give it my Python code as a string and it runs it. You can see me calling to the strip indent function. This is to strip the unnecessary indention from the string. You know it's important in Python because Python likes indention to be done correctly. All right. So now we've got running Python code. How are we going to get data into it and out of it? So how do you get data into it? Well, the native way, you know, the natural way for getting data into jobs in, in Jenkins is jobs job parameters. You get the GUI with a form the user can fill in, or other, you know, the stuff that trigger your, your jobs all can also can pass information is in, as job parameters. And the nice thing about Jenkins is that it just sets everything in jobs parameters as environment variables. So using it from Python is trivial. You just use the environ object from the OS package, and you can just read it. Uh, you can see my little example down there. Um, how do you get data out? Well, you need to create files. I mean, this is the way you get data out in Jenkins. And then it can do various stuff with files. You know, various Jenkins plugins can read a file back and do stuff with it. In this example, for example, you see me writing a file in a Java properties format, which is a very simple format. You just use do a variable name equals the value. And then the Jenkins plugins that know how to run other jobs actually knows to read that file back and use that data. So we actually got a way here to create parameters from other jobs directly from Python code. Um, and if we can, you know, create parameters for other jobs, we can start thinking about doing stuff like moving py whole Python objects between jobs. And we can just use something like pickle. Here, what I'm doing is serializing the object to a string with pickle, and then I also compress it and you know, you do by, uh, base 54, 64 encoding um, to make sure the string is safe and is not going to get corrupted along the way or something like that. Um, so here we got the read, you know, writing function and the reading function. Pretty simple, actually. One nice thing about about the pipeline uh, style of jobs is that in Groovy, actually Groovy can take input uh, for you know parameters for functions as mapping objects, which are essentially the same as dicts in in Python. 
So one thing you can do is we actually can generate the, the whole, all the parameters that, groovy, that the groovy, groovy function is going to need. You can just generate a dict that contains them in Python and then save it to something like JSON and read it back from Groovy. Another nice thing is you can actually even create Groovy objects from that because in Groovy, if you have a mapping that contains the dollar sign class key with the name of a class, it will instantiate that class and pass all the other stuff in the dict as, a, as parameters to the constructor. So what you're seeing here is I'm actually creating a class of a string parameter value and passing it parameters. So this is how you specify, oh, sorry. This is how you specify parameters for um, the build command in Groovy. Here is how to use it. Um, one thing that might be con uh, confusing for Python people, you know, in Groovy you can call functions without parentheses. So here I'm calling the build function, passing it the output of the read JSON function that is going to read the JSON file I created from uh, Python. All right. Now, one um, nice thing you can do is you can actually save state. Why would I want to save state? Um, for example, I want to, you know, keep statistics around. I have the same jobs running multiple times. I want to keep it around, you know, draw graphs or something. Um, uh, so let's see how we do it. Well, the way to do it, uh, Jenkins lets you, gives you the way to make jobs save artifacts, which essentially means they save files. And it actually gives you the way to actually also read those artifacts back from other jobs. So the trick here is to actually use the same, you know, write and read those same artifacts from uh, the same job. Um, so, you know, you have your code, you create, you know, you, you output your state to a file, you export it as an artifact, Jenkins save it, and then in the next run around, you read it back. Okay, so let's look a bit about how an implementa implementation of this looks like. Um, so you need something to read your state or your object from the artifacts file. Uh, it's pretty simple, just uh, reading it from, you know, I'm using cyclical here. Uh, one thing to look at is the exception handling there. This is handling the case where, you know, the first time around when I don't actually have an artifact file yet. So what I'm doing here is passing a class and I just I'm going to instantiate it. Um, uh, and then, you know, the second function there is the one that saves it back. Pretty simple. Take a file, use cpickle, write it back to the file. All right, once I have that, I can, you know, it's something that we need to do before and, you know, we start and after we finish. So the, na the natural thing to do in Python is use a context manager for this. So here's a simple context manager wrap wrapper that reads the data before we start yields back so we can have our code run and then writes it back when we finish. The next thing we need to do is create some kind of object to, you know, it needs to be a mutable object. Uh, so, you know, if we if, even if we need to store one int, we need some kind of class or something around it that can, that can be mutable. So I'm creating a class here, very simple one. And I hope you can, I hope you can see it. Just use the context manager and inside it use your code to do whatever you want to the object. So this is how we do it, the Python side, you know, how, let's see how the Jenkins slides of this looks like. This is a pipeline implementation. Um, what I do is I load the data. What you see there is, um, you know, inside the load data stage, I use the copy artifacts step to um, get the file, you know, get Jenkins to bring me the, back the, stat, the state file. Then I can run my Python, and in the last stage, the save data stage, I actually tell Python to archive the file back. One thing to note there, that dear state, delete dear touch file thing in the beginning, you need to make sure you don't have state leaking from in from other jobs that may have run on the same build slave or something like that, so you need to clean up before you begin, making sure you don't have you know files going around. All right, so what we talk about. Um, 
you can run Python code, simple shell, the shell, the basic shell functionality of Jenkins, can you can just use that to run Python. You get input via environment variables, you get output by creating files, and you can use JSON to pass stuff into Groovy, you can use Pickle to save whole objects, you can use property files, Mot a lot of Jen stuff in Jenkins can get property files and work with them. And uh, you do object persistence with uh, the archived pickle files. Right, so you might be saying, thinking like, Barack, you're cheating. You're not actually writing Python on Jenkins, you're writing Python from Jenkins. I want to run Python actually on Jenkins, you know, on the same JVM maybe, so. How do you run Python on a JVM? Well, you use Jiton. Um, you know, it's a nice project. They have a full implementation of Python written in Java. It currently supports up to 2.7. You know, Python free support is coming. Um, and then, but the way, if you want to add Java code to Jenkins, you need to write Jenkins plugins. And the way to write Jenkins plugins is to write Java classes and then use Java annotations to tell Jenkins what those Java classes are going to be used for. And unfortunately, Jiton doesn't give you a, a very easy way to do it. You actually need to write Java code to give it the Java class structure. There is a project called uh, Clamp that gives you the way to do it with Jiton, but you need to write Java for that. There's actually a full, a whole, another project that gives you more, a little bit more automation around it, which is the Jiton plugins uh, project. Uh, I mean, unfortunately, it's a little bit unmaintained. The last build was from a couple of years ago. I actually sent them a pull request to build, to out, you know, release a new build, but I'm not seeing much, uh, yeah, traffic going there, unfortunately. And also, this is Java. You know, your development process becomes writing Java classes, then writing implementation in Python, then writing build tools, getting, you know, a by a Jenkins plugin file, you know, starting at Jenkins, installing the plugin, and then you start seeing your code running. And this is not why we're using Python for you know we want you know just type stuff in and let, and get it up and running as quickly as possible. So, actually, with Groovy, there's a few nice things tricks you can do to get stuff running faster. Groovy has a nice thing that called grab that lets you from Groovy code actually ask it to dynamically load code directly from Maven, which is kind of like the pip for the Java world, and just give you access to that code immediately. So here in the first line, you can see me actually loading the entire Jiton interpreter into Groovy. And once you loaded the Jiton interpreter, you can just instantiate it. It's a Java object. Um, you know, first you need to import it. But once you import it, as you can see here, um, you can instantiate the interpreter. Um, you see here, interpreter equals new Python interpreter. And then you can pass it, pass it uh, your Python code. And the nice thing, you don't have actually to pass fully executable Python code. You can just try pass in models with functions and the interpreter will keep that in memory and you can actually ask back the f uh, to get the, uh, the Java objects that represents stuff in your Python. So here, I'm taking a Python function back out from the interpreter. You can see in the last line, interpreter.get and the name of a Python function and then get a, a get an object that represents that function. And then I can just call it, you know, directly from the Groovy code. Um, I need to do some work to wrap arguments around, you know, convert them from the Java world into the Python world. You know, and you're all developers here, so you can think about ways to generalize that so it becomes pretty transparent. But yeah, we got full Python crowd running inside the Jenkins VM with full access, you know, to everything, Jenkins internals, whatever. Okay, so we have some time left. A um, couple of applications we have in Overit something we called Overit Standard CI. The idea is that let developers write stuff they need to run in CI without knowing anything about the CI infrastructure like Jenkins and storage and build slaves and stuff like that. So we actually created a specification where developers 
you can just add some files to their project with requesting, you know, telling my CI needs, you know, to run on CentOS 7 and I really need those packages and stuff like that. And and then, you know, give the shell scripts or whatever they want to run in CI. And you need quite a bit of logic to parse those files and figure out, you know, make the CI system figure out what to do. Um, so that logic is written in Python. Uh, it, it's actually nice because you can actually let developers simulate the entire CI system locally, you know, debug stuff before they actually send it to the big evil CI system. Uh, so that's standard CI. Another application is what we call change gating. The idea is that you have a big flow of changes coming in from all kinds of projects in Overt all at once and you run to run more complicated tests for example what you've seen in the previous lecture you know system tests that run with Lago and you cannot run that kind of test for each and every change you know you don't just don't have enough resources that you know it's not fast enough so what we do we run in we run them in batches and if something fails, you need to do some kind of bisection back and find that exact change to, that made it fail so you need to track data about the changes and you need data structures for you know queuing them up and, and doing the bisection and stuff like that and it's very very easy and natural to write a, th write a thing like that in python i wouldn't even want to try doing that in you know groovy it wouldn't be fun uh, um so that's all the slides i've have i have uh thank you guys very much and any questions yeah. Well, you know, I, I, I'm I a little spoiled. I will, I will always run on Linux. So on Linux, you can just expect it. But yep, it, it's there. But if not, you know, you need to maybe set up your build slaves beforehand or use a container framework that will give you a container image with Python in it or something like that. OK, thank you, guys.